This morning, <clears throat> we're looking at um, Romans chapter 13. Our text is going to be verse 14, but I'd like to read for you the, uh, the, the 14 verses of Romans 13, only because it contains a, a good amount of instruction for us in a variety of areas, all of which give us a little bit more of the picture of what it means to be holy, what it means to be like Jesus. And I would just simply ask you as I read through this, Compare it to how Jesus lived and see if he didn't do precisely what it is that we're being called to do uh, by the Apostle Paul in this section. And then Paul, of course, uh, caps off this section, rounds it off with the exhortation to put on Jesus Christ, to become just like him. Romans 13, beginning in verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Well, may the Lord bless uh, this portion of his word to our hearing this morning. Now, for those of you who have been here over the past uh, couple of Lord's Days, you know we've been looking at the subject of holiness, uh, what it means to be holy. And so far we've seen, first of all, what holiness is. It's also it's very helpful to know uh, what it is we're supposed to become. And though we might be able to just simply say, Generally, it's becoming like Jesus Christ. It's good to know it a little bit more specifically. Now, the first thing we learned about holiness is that it is a separation. It, it, it has to do with our being separated from common use, as it were, what we call secular, secularism, to sacred use, or to be separated from the world, to be separated to God. No longer to live for the world, but now to live for God. Now, when you came to Jesus Christ, uh, when you uh, only by His grace, of course, turned from your sins and looked to Him as your personal Savior, uh, when you surrendered to Him as your personal Lord, you need to realize your life no longer belonged to you. Now it belongs to Him. Now, really, we do have to acknowledge it never really did be, you know, belong to you to begin with. You have always belonged to God. I mean, He's the one who made you. You are His creatures. Uh, he has sovereign right over you to do what He will. Now, again, you may not have realized it, and you may not have lived 
like you belong to him. As a matter of fact, you probably lived. I'm sure you did. I did as well, like the rest of the world when we didn't know him. As um, one English poet, William Ernest Henley, expresses in his famous poem, Invictus, as the master of your fate and the captain of your soul. In other words, you had the helm of your life. You were living the way you wanted to live, doing your own thing, but you need to realize you had no right to do that. And none of us ever had any right to do that. And when the Lord opened your eyes by His Spirit and you trusted Jesus Christ, you really began to see that that is true, that you really don't belong to yourself. You really do belong to Him. And you also began to see what it is that God wants you to be, what He actually made you to be, especially as His redeemed child, to be holy as He is holy. You know, the Bible tells us God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. He now dwells in temples made without hands. He dwells in your hearts. You are the temple of God. He dwells in you by His Holy Spirit. And so you need to be very careful, Paul says, as to how you now live. He writes in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You see, being the temple of God, God wants you to live in a certain way, having His Spirit within you. The Spirit is moving you to live in a particular way. As a matter of fact, He's given you the desire to live uh, this way. And, if, and we'll, uh, Well, we know without that desire, we never would. But that's what it means, the Spirit of God dwells in you. But we also saw, secondly, that God has not only given you or set you apart to Himself to be His, and given you the desire then to be holy and the call to be holy, that he has also given you um, incentives, incentives to be holy. He says, for instance, that he will make you secure. He will take care of your needs throughout your entire life. He will give you those things that the people of the world scramble about and are in fear of not having every single day, food and clothing and protection. He says he will give those things to you if you will put his interests first, if you will seek to be holy. Again, Jesus says in Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He will give you security not only in this life, but he will also give you security in the world to come. Jesus says regarding his people in John 10, verse 28, and I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. If you are trusting Jesus Christ, which you can know that you are by the fact that you are pursuing holiness, Jesus says you have eternal life, and you will never perish. But of course, you really can't know that you have eternal life unless you are pursuing holiness. So holiness is the evidence that these privileges belong to you, security in life, seeking first the kingdom of heaven, and that God will keep you secure forever. I mean, what is the biggest question on the heart of every Christian? Do I know the Lord Jesus Christ? Am I His? Do I belong to Him? Am I going to be safe when I die, or am I only deceiving myself? Well, holiness is the way you can know that you belong to Him, because everyone who trusts in the Lord, everyone in whom the Spirit of God lives, is being made holy. Now again, he gives us other incentives we saw that are certain privileges. He adopts you into his family. He gives you all the rights and privileges of his children, not the least of which the eternal inheritance in heaven. Jesus came into the world and he did a work that earns for him the kingdom. It belongs to him. And he's willing to give it to you if you will trust him and follow him if you will be holy. He promises He will give you the strength to do that. He will transform you by His Spirit so that you really do become like Him. And of course, He will also give you the greatest privilege that any human being can have in this world, the privilege of being the herald of this good news to other people so that they can escape hell and enter into heaven by trusting 
Jesus Christ. And then in addition to all of this, we saw that he also promises to reward you for all the things that you're doing. I mean, he's already given you heaven when you deserve hell. He's already given you all these rights and these privileges. He's going to take care of you and so forth. But as you serve him in this world, he also says he's going to reward you. He's going to give you something for everything that you do for him. And that, I would remind you, is the only thing, the only thing that you and I will ever be able to take out of this world. Everything else we have to leave behind. But whatever you do for the Lord, you can have forever. And that doesn't mean just the things specifically that you would do that we think of as religious service. But all that you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, you're, you're to do all of this to the glory of God. And when you do, God rewards you for it. But especially when you share the gospel with others. Well, having seen what holiness is and understanding something about the benefits of holiness this morning, let's consider how to be holy, how to be like Jesus. And I want us to look at two things from our passage that really you need to do if you are to be holy. And these things are very general, but I think self, almost self-explanatory in many ways, especially if you've been reading your Bibles and you know anything about Jesus Christ. The first thing you must do is put on Jesus Christ. And the second thing you must do is not leave any room in your life for sin. Now again, general, but let's unpack this a little bit. First of all, Paul says you must put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does Paul mean by that? Does he mean grow a beard, throw on a robe and sandals, hit the streets? Of course not. He doesn't want you to resemble Jesus externally. Sometimes we get that idea, don't we? When we see him, we'll be like him you know, will be transformed into his same image and you wonder, am I going to look like Jesus physically? Well, no, no, you're not. You're going to look like you. And you always need to look like you. But what he wants you to do is to resemble him internally, not externally. Okay, to put on something means that you are to clothe yourself with that thing. You know, clothe yourself with Christ. Put on his character. Have his heart. Now, we just read in Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24, this, that in reference to your former manner of life, the way you used to live, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. You see, to put on Jesus Christ, to clothe yourself with Christ means to behave as Jesus would behave, but not just to act like Jesus. You know, not going around just like actors act on the screen, on stage, or in movies, you know, trying or pretending there's somebody else. But to do this actually from the heart. Because that is what you really want to do. And not just something that you have to do. But again, remember... It doesn't happen automatically. You do have to do it. You do have to put effort into it. But God has given you a desire, and that makes it easier, isn't it? Or doesn't it? Okay. Well, how did Jesus live? Now, again, generally, how did Jesus live? We have the entire Bible to tell us how Jesus lived. But let me just summarize. Jesus lived every moment in his Father's presence. The awareness that his Father knew Okay, that he saw everything that Jesus did, which didn't, of course, give him any distress. He loved that, that the Father saw him, that he heard every word that Jesus spoke, that he understood every thought in his mind and knew everything that was in his heart. Now, that might be a cause of fear to us because we're not like Jesus, but it wasn't a fear to Jesus because his whole life was a continual act of devotion to God. See, God knew that in Jesus' heart was a love for him and that he did everything that he did for him. He knew what Jesus was really after. And knowing that the Father saw all these things, knowing that he understood all these things, Jesus lived to please the Father. His whole life was devoted to him as a continual act of 
worship. That's how he lived. He says in John 8, 29, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Now when we ask the question, how can you be more like Jesus? The first answer is you must follow his example outwardly and inwardly. The example that he's given to you. Remember, he didn't die just to save you from your sins, but he died to break the power of sin in your life and to enable you to become like him. So how do you become like Jesus in this way? Well, first of all, live in the presence of God. When you're faced with a choice, and how many choices do you have in life? I mean, when you open the mailbox, how many choices are you given? Uh, every moment throughout the day, we are say, we're faced with a series of choices. That's what life is, decisions, constant decisions. Am I going to do this or that? Am I going to choose to do this or that? Well, right now you're faced with a choice. Whether to listen to what the Lord is, is saying here in His Word or to tune out. Whether to act upon it if you understand what it is He's saying or just to keep on going in the direction that you have been going. But you see, whatever the choice, you need to make a conscious decision at all times to do what you know is pleasing to the Father. That's what it means to clothe yourself with Christ. Well, how can you know what it is that God wants? Well, again, he's given you his word, hasn't he? He's given you the Bible, particularly the commandments. Now, it means when you clothe yourself with Christ that when you speak, and all of us are talking all the time, aren't we, and some of us more than others, we need to be careful what we say. We need to make sure that what we are saying is pleasing to God. Uh, the Holy Spirit says through Paul the Apostle, and we already read this in Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, and the word unwholesome there means anything that's unedifying, anything that's not going to be profitable to the people you're talking to or about, something that is bad. Okay, don't let any unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, something that builds them up, something that will help them according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. You want to clothe yourself with Christ when you speak. You need to make sure you're saying things that are going to bless those who hear you and, and not be a source of grief to them. He also says in Ephesians 5 verses 1 through 6, Therefore, is, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. You notice how he includes language along with the other things that we could possibly do. And he gives this warning, for this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. If you're going to clothe yourself with Christ, it means a number of things. It means making good choices, choices that honor God, but it also means speaking good words that are going to minister to others. You also need to make sure your thoughts are honoring to Him. Your desires are the things that God approves of, that you're taking every thought captive and that every desire is for the glory of God, that you love Him and you're seeking to honor Him in all that you do because he's worthy, because it's right, because it's good, because of the rewards and everything that he promises. But again, how can you know whether your thoughts are pleasing to God? How can you know whether your desires, what's in your heart, is, is what pleases him or not? Well, again, the word of God gives you help. As the author to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, 
and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God understands us all too well, doesn't he? And he knows what's in our minds and he knows what's in our hearts, but he has given us his word to show us what is in our mind, what is in our hearts, what's in our souls, what it is that's driving us, what's moving us, what we're thinking. Well, we need to compare those things with what we see God wants us to have in our minds and in our hearts. If we were to be like Jesus Christ, we have to put on what we know would be pleasing to God. We need to think in his presence and know that he sees that and know that he sees our desires. And so basically to clothe yourself with Christ means to act or make decisions, to speak, to think, and to want or desire as Jesus would if he were living your life, if he was you. So you need to be like him. That's what he wants you to do. That's what it means to be holy. He's given us many incentives to do this, but this is what it means. This is how, okay? But second, he also says this, and you ever notice how the scripture always hits both sides? You know, it doesn't just say do this one thing, but it also talks about the opposite because we need it, don't we? We already read how Paul said, let the thief steal no longer. Well, that's not enough. He's got to do more than just not steal. He's got to work with his own hands that he might have something to give to those who are in need. There's the positive and there's the negative. Now, we've seen the positive, put on Jesus Christ, but here's the negative. Don't leave any room in your life for anything that is contrary to what Jesus would do, okay? Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh with regard to its lust. Do you think Jesus left any room in his life for sin? Of course not. Well, that's what you and I are supposed to do. Now, what he is literally saying here is stop planning to sin. Stop planning to sin. Now, do we ever do that? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, we do it. More than we should. We shouldn't at all. But far more than perhaps we would... Uh, impute to ourselves or admit, okay? Sometimes we, we do sin spontaneously. Sometimes we're, we're struck with, with a sudden temptation and we just fall right into it. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. We know something that, that we know what we were thinking about doing is wrong, but we do it anyway. And we excuse ourselves by saying, you know, it doesn't really matter. God isn't really that scrupulous. He's really not that picky. He understands my weaknesses. He'll forgive me. And so we use those as excuses to sin. Well, we're to make no provision for excuses. We're to make no provision for sudden temptation. We're to be on our guard all the time. But you know what? Sometimes we even plan to sin. Sometimes we feel a subtle temptation to do something and maybe we begin to argue with ourselves, well, maybe it's wrong. But then we think about it a little bit more and we think, well, maybe it's not that bad after all. Maybe it's really a good thing. And then before you know it, we fall right into it. You see, that's why Jeremiah tells us not to trust our own hearts because they're deceitful. How do we know that what we're contemplating is good or bad? By the word of God and not by the way we feel about it because our hearts will deceive us. Now Paul says if you're going to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're going to be holy, you need to fortify yourself against sin. You need to plug these holes up and make no provisions. Again, as I've already reminded you. Now again, there's... there's Many good reasons why you should do this, and we've seen those by way of blessings and privileges that the Lord is going to give us, and we've also seen the downside of allowing any sin in your life. Uh, that's what we've been considering in the evening sermons, so I don't want to review those for you this morning, but I will this evening as we round off that mini-series as well. 
But certainly, <clears throat> we should do this because it is good for us to do this. Because sin always leads to some kind of a problem. It either dishonors the Lord, and of course, if we haven't repented and trusted Christ, it's adding judgment to us. Or it injures somebody else. It hurts somebody in some way. There's a reason, a good reason, why the Lord tells us to do what he tells us to do. It's not just arbitrary, just for no reason, sort of you know, set up this random set of rules and just wants to enforce it on us because he's God and he can do it. But he does it because they are good. They are the very definition of what is good. They are good for everyone, not just you, but others. So how can you be more like Jesus Christ? How can you pursue holiness? First, you need to clothe yourself with Jesus. You need to choose what he would choose, talk as he would talk, think as he would think, desire as he would desire, want what he wants. And you must make sure you don't leave any room in your life for the contrary, for sin, for the things he tells you are bad. Well, finally, and a little bit perhaps more practically, we have another question. Okay, we have not only the, the, the standard, as it were, what is the blueprint? What direction am I to follow? Well, here's the direction. Jesus, he's given to you, you know, a living example of what God looks like in human flesh. The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we saw his glory. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, John tells us, has exegeted God. He has explained him to us. We have actually seen how God would live if he were living as one of us. That's how we are to live. That's why, you know, again, be holy as I am holy. Be perfect as I am perfect. Uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. But how do you do that? You know, where do you find the power to put on Jesus? Where do you find the power to put off sin and make no room in your life for it? Well, you know you're not going to find it in yourself because you and I don't have that power. We don't have that strength. You can't do it on your own. That's the reason why there's a gospel. That's the reason why there's this good news. That's why God sent his son into the world. As I mentioned earlier, not only to free you from guilt so that you wouldn't go to hell, but to set you free from the power of sin so that you could live a holy life. If you want to be holy, you have to start here. You have to know Jesus Christ. You have to believe on him. You know, the, the, the message of the gospel is so very simple, isn't it? That sometimes we, we almost tune it out every time it comes around, but we do need to listen to it. Turn from your sins. Trust Jesus Christ and him alone to save you. Now, the danger of having heard it so many times is if you've heard it, and you haven't responded to it, each time you hear it and don't respond to it, you get a little bit harder against it. There's something that's called gospel hardening, where you can hear the truth so many times that it no longer has any impact in your life. As a matter of fact, we have to be careful even as believers that that doesn't happen to us. We have the Lord's Supper, you know, every week, and sometimes it can lose its significance because we have it every week and we do it so often and so forth, but we can't let it lose its significance. We don't want to become hardened against it. We want to take it seriously. We want to take everything that God says seriously. If you haven't responded to the gospel, if you haven't turned from your sins and trusted Jesus Christ, you need to do that. God says to you in Hebrews 4, 7, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. There's only one way you can reject the gospel, and that is by hardening your heart against it. Every time you do that, it gets a little bit harder, and you don't want it to become to the point where God may no longer work in your heart at all. There, the Bible tells us that possibility exists, and so you don't want that to happen. Pray that God would change your heart and give you the desire to come to him. But you need to realize as well with regard to the how question that once you've trusted Jesus Christ, the work is not over, not by a long shot. There's more that, that you need to do. There's more that I need to do. Paul has given us a command here, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and put off sin. 
There's work you need to put into this, into growing into the image of Christ. It requires work on your part. It doesn't happen automatically. It's, it's strange how sin can deceive us into thinking it does. But what did Paul mean when he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Because it is a God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now again, I'm not saying that you have to do this to be saved. What I'm saying is if you are saved, this is what you will do. This is the fruit that will flow from this conversion. So how can you cooperate? How can you move the process along? What does he want you to do? Well, you need to use what God has given to you. The means of sanctification, what we call the means of grace, the way that God will sanctify you. Read your Bibles. Try to understand what the Bible says. That's what reading the Bible together is all about, right? Is reading the Bible and trying to understand what it says. But don't forget, God hasn't called you to be a walking encyclopedia of knowledge that can answer any Bible questions, kind of like the Bible Answer Man, you know, that Walter Martin, I guess, when he used to do the Bible Answer Man program, which he's, he's gone to be with the Lord and somebody else has taken his place, one person asked him one time, do you have like a team of experts that are looking up all the answers to these questions so that you can, you know, answer all these questions? He says, he goes, he goes no, he, he goes, do you have a computer that you use? He says, I only have one computer, it's right here. And all of it's in here, and I answer from in here because I read the Bible, okay? Well, we need to be able to do that, maybe not quite to that proficiency, although we should become as proficient as we can. But, and I'm not saying Walter Martin did this, don't, don't look at this as a negative example, but we can't have it just up here and not have it reach our lives, you see. Uh, it doesn't do you any good if you know the right thing to do, but you don't do it, or you know the wrong thing to stay away from, but you still do it. That doesn't do you any good. As a matter of fact, it works against you, doesn't it? Because now you're more culpable because you know the truth. What, what did Jesus say about Capernaum, you know, and, and uh, the cities in which he preached the gospel? He said it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for Tyre and Sidon, for Capernaum, because he preached there and he gave them more light. They were culpable, but those in Sodom and Gomorrah who committed horrendous sins did so in the dark. They did not know God's truth as Jesus had revealed it through his word and through his miracles in Capernaum. So we do need to be careful how we handle what we know. We need to make sure we apply what we know and what we read to our lives. As I mentioned in the evening service, even one sin can sink you forever if you don't repent of it. If you know God tells you not to do it and you do it, or if, you, if he tells you uh, do something and you don't do it, we have to be seeking to put on and put off in every area, and that's what we will do if we are true believers. Read the Bible. Apply the Bible. Live the Bible. Become like Jesus Christ. Seek God in prayer. Seek Him earnestly to give you power, to give you strength to live the kind of life He calls you to live. Spend time worshiping God. Meet with His people on the day of worship. Worship in private. Worship on Wednesdays uh, with God's people as we meet together to study, and as we meet together to pray. Those are things that will help you and strengthen you and in, by God's grace, enlighten you. Fellowship with other believers. Get together and pray with other believers. Spend time with Christians and let their desire for Jesus Christ encourage you to desire Him more. And then make sure you avoid those relationships and those people that you know are going to weaken your resolve to follow the Lord. You know, bad company corrupts good morals. And of course, where you're aware of sin in your life, make sure that you repent of all sin. Now, if you do these things and you do them faithfully, you will grow in holiness. You will become more like Jesus Christ. But if you don't, or if you don't do it as you should with the kind of faithfulness and zeal, and by the way, it's kind of like a virtuous circle you don't just start off devouring these things. You start off one step at a time. And you read and you apply and you pray and you ask God for grace and you fellowship. And each step of the way is a step higher and higher 
to greater and greater spirituality, to greater and greater Christ-likeness. The more you do these things, the more you will be like Jesus Christ. But the less you do them, or if you leave them alone, the less you're going to be like him, the more spiritually weak and anemic you're going to be, and the more indifferent you're going to become to spiritual things. It's like a step down, one step at a time. Well, I hope you see this morning that the Lord does not leave you with that option. That's the reason why there's commandments in Scripture, because He knows the deceitfulness of our hearts. He knows that we're going to convince ourselves we don't need these things. I'm fine without these things. I'm enough like Jesus Christ already. He's already purchased heaven. I don't need to do these things. Well, I think the Lord makes it quite clear that you do and that I do. He says to you this morning, again through our text, Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a command. And make no provision for your flesh with regard to its lust. No provision, no room. That is a command. That is God's will that you be holy even as he is holy. Well, may the Lord help all of us to hear that this morning, to remember that, and to live that. Let's, uh, let's spend a few moments in silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to, to help us do just that.